Welcome everyone, this is Cindy Lowen. I'm a dietitian and medical affairs manager at Nestle Health Science. I will be moderating today's presentation entitled, Intral Nutrition in the ICU, COVID-19 Challenges. I'm very pleased to present today's speakers who truly require no introduction. Dr. Robert Martindale is a tenured faculty member at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. He is currently a professor of surgery and medical director for hospital nutrition services at OHSU. His primary focus throughout his career has been on medical, surgical, and nutrition education. He cares for patients with complex nutrition issues in the OHSU nutrition clinic, hospital, and intensive care unit. He has won numerous teaching awards and continues to mentor young physicians and investigators, including serving as faculty for the Nestle Nutrition Institute Clinical Nutrition Fellowship for Physicians. Dr. Martindale is the author of over 300 publications. His research interests include perioperative methods for optimizing surgical outcomes, abdominal wall reconstruction, surgical metabolism, management of gastrointestinal fistulae, and nutritional modulation of immunity. Our second guest is Dr. Jayshil Patel. He's an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He has received several research, teaching, and mentorship awards. Dr. Patel is also an associate editor for nutrition and clinical practice and reviews manuscripts for numerous journals including Annals of Internal Medicine and the Journal of Parental and Enteral Nutrition. He has over 50 publications. His research interests are evaluating the impact of trophic feeding and septic shock, protein augmentation in critical illness, and critical care outcomes of patients with sarcopenic obesity. It is now my privilege to give you Drs. Martindale and Patel to discuss enteral nutrition in the ICU COVID-19 challenges. Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending, I guess, where you are. The objectives today is because this obviously is a very hot topic in the country today and actually throughout the world today. We're going to try to look at the nutritional issues. Remember, looking at the ICU patient with severe acute respiratory syndrome associated with COVID-2, we're not going to try to answer the, you know, what to do outside the ward or what they should do at home, just what they should do in the ICU. And maybe we're also going to describe the recommendation for internal nutrition and then discuss some of the potential things which you might do in the future. Okay, well, as you can see from this slide, this is a growing crisis. As you'll notice, this was the numbers taken from Tuesday the 31st at 12 o'clock noon. Already, worldwide confirmed cases are well over a million with over 50,000 deaths. In the United States, we've got now over 230,000 as of today's CDC count. 230,000 cases with over 6,000 deaths in the United States. In Italy, we've got 115,000 cases. In Spain, over 110,000 cases. So clearly, we're all going to be involved in this. So today, we have to look at this as any other issue. Critical illness exists in phases, like all critical illness, early, late, and post-acute. During the acute phase, we see this hypermetabolism, hypercatabolism, which is generally the rule for all of our critically ill patients. What's especially important here, though, is the, the COVID-19 patients is a subset of those patients who get severe acute hyperinflammatory conditions. So we know that's a setup, and that's why we see, I think, these deaths arising. So the amino acids are mobilized and predominantly from the muscle, as we know, and obviously, the, the critical illness induces tremendous gut dysfunction with dysbiosis, which that only not only propagates and accentuates the inflammatory response, it just causes significant cellular dysfunction as well. The characteristics are key here. If we look at this early publication from China, from Wuhan, China, where it all started, you can see some interesting dis distribution here. You can see the age group, usually they're a higher age group when they get this. Case fatality rate, you can see, usually the elderly get case fatality. We also know the spectrum of disease and how many, and certainly the far majority, vast majority of these are asymptomatic patients. 
On this slide, you'll notice a little bit finer tuning of what happened to some of these patients in China and Wuhan. What's dramatic here is if you look at the left side of the screen, the orange, the little orange box there represents this population. And then the other side, if you look at that, those are the ones who died. The ones who got discharged did nowhere near had the inflammatory condition. Now you'd notice the inflammatory condition was not just the pulmonary system, cardiac tamp, you know, troponin there. So they had lung involvement, not only lung involvement, but they had cardiac involvement. They had muscle, you can see myoglobin muscle involvement. The CRPs were elevated dramatically. You get so sort of, we're getting we're seeing sort of this cytochrome cytokine storm coming in. If you look at the cause of death there, very important, 36% of these patients die respiratory failure. 22, additional 22% has respiratory failure and cardiac failure. And if you look at the cause of who's dying with this, it's all, all the elderly, the right upper quadrant there, if you look at that on the screen, those that died were the ones in the beige coloring there, and you can see it's the elderly population. So nothing new. What's new here is for that we've heard in the news, new from what we've heard in the news, but you can see is this is much higher cytokine, uh, cytokine response than we normally see. Now, if we look at this situation, this is New England Journal of Medicine published four days ago. This is the U.S. Seattle experience, okay? So they took, if you look at this, there's 24 critically ill patients, all admitted to the ICU, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, so SARS COVID 2, okay, nine hospitals, mean age was 64, 63% male, seven days before admissions, you can see they started having symptoms. About 50% of these people had fever, 58% had diabetes. So admitting diagnosis, hypoxemic respiratory failure in all of them. But here's the kicker. 50% of these people died in 18 days. Of the 12 surviving, four went home, four were still in the hospital, and three were on mechanical ventilation when this paper was written. So you can see this is dramatic because these are 64, average age, 64-year-old, and 50% of them died. That's unheard of for routine ARDS. Now, let's look at the world situation. Now, remember, this is the global perspective. When we look at these papers, when I pulled in all the papers from from China, which has now been written, we're seeing several coming in. I've listened to several groups, and I've talked to several friends in Italy, where we've got their, their what they've got. I've got some friends around the United States and what they're seeing. So I've kind of pulled it all together there, right? The most patients are in situations of severe, the ones that get to the ICU and require intubation, et cetera, are severely inflamed. That addresses it. They're anorexic, hypoxemic, and they've got a tremendous increased work of breathing. What's interesting about this population is they have a normal or low white blood cells. They have decreased lymphocytes, elevated LFTs, and you notice their GI intolerance. Up to 30% of these patients have GI intolerance. Now, what does this mean for us as nutrition people? First of all, this is an older population, clearly from what we just looked at. They may have pre-existing malnutrition, and clearly most elderly people have sarcopenia. Okay, so now we're dealing with someone who's got very little muscle reserve to feed this the hypermetabolic situation, hyperinflamed situation. Many of them had pre-existing malnutrition. For example, the, the Seattle group, 58%, or the Covan group had 58% diabetes, severe ARDS, refractory to our normal ventilatory low tidal volume mechanisms. They actually require, in many cases, prone positioning and ECMO. Does that change our nutrition? Many have circulatory failure, as I mentioned to you. You know, up to 24% have respiratory and cardiac failure. Does that mean if they're not, it get inadequate perfusion? Do we have to worry about in, lack of perfusion to the gut? Do we have to we start with parenteral maybe in that situation where they can't feed the gut? We're not getting enough perfusion through the myocardium to get gut uh, circulation. And they develop multiple organ failure. We know in the past, we've got good data now showing that multiple organ failure, in fact, does better with enteral nutrition. So we got lots of questions, lots of questions. And again, we're dealing, in some cases, trying to extrapolate previous ARDS data, previous cardiac circula circulation failure data, 
and it's very difficult. So we are really flying by the seat of our pants. So what are the principles here? Infection control, that's probably one of the first things we need to think about. We don't want to infect other people. So we've got to be very careful of the appropriate use of PPE. Support require, what are we going to need? If we're going to prone somebody and we've got a feeding tube in, that may require a whole other person just to hold the feeding tube in place during the proning. Duration of disease, we can expect to require intubation, require ICU stay for approximately 10 days to two weeks for most of these patients. So that means we're going to need coverage and get nutrition formulas and feeding tubes and pumps available for two weeks of therapy, and then that sort of fits with our resources. So our principles relevant now that are different than routinely for our ICU patients, and we do cluster care meaning that all attempts are made to bundle these and limit exposure to the other healthcare workers. We adhere to Center for Disease Control recommendations to minimize exposure with COVID positive patients. Okay, so that's routine. We try to preserve the use of personal protective devices by doing this clustered care, minimizing the number of changes to go into the room, et cetera. So let's go ahead with our recommendations. So our First recommendation is pretty straightforward, about 15 to 20 kilocalories per kilogram per day of actual body weight. You can see 1.2 to 2 gram per kilo per day of adjusted body weight. So now that's pretty routine. You notice we're not pushing 25 or 30 here. We want to stay at a relative end because these, again, are hyperinflamed patients, okay? So, but if now many of these patients may have not eaten a week or so, 10 days before they got to us. So we have to think about refeeding syndrome. So if they've not eaten or not taken caloric energy for seven days, we need to start with about 25% of our calorie goal and slowly increase. Clear observation of watching phosphate, mag, and potassium like we would any patient with risk for refeeding syndrome. Okay, we should initiate intro feeling early because we know the data is pretty solid that if we feed within 24 to 36 hours of admission, uh, we know the outcomes are better. Okay, we know we've got multiple meta-analysis between 2000 and 2013. We show less infectious disease. We get shorter length of ICU stay, getting people out of the hospital faster. So we know it's safe in most cases. So we should we should try enteral feeding whenever possible, unless they've got escalating doses of vasopressors and their symptoms of significant gastric ileus. We should try to hopefully within 12 hours of intubation start trickling something into the small bowel. You placed at the time of intubation that saves you an X-ray because everybody gets an X-ray after the after a, uh, you know endotracheal tube is placed, so you can then find that is the tube in the stomach because you want to decompress stomach when you intubate them. So it saves you an X-ray and saves a lot of manipulation of the oral pharynx. It's not a problem feeding through an 18 French nasogastric or orogastric tube. If we're unable to ha feed the stomach for whatever, worsening ileus, worsening hemodynamics, convert to PN relatively early in this case. We don't want to get any trouble. What do we watch for for that timing of conversion? Distension, worsening hemodynamic, gastric contents, notice in the suctioning, all the normal things we would look for. Remember, this is the idea that we're going to limit the number of people that are getting exposed to potential viral uh, exposure. So what should we use? We should use a standard intral isotonic 1 to 1.5 kcal of a high-protein formula. We should start slow. Again, we've got lots of data now showing we shouldn't worry about gaining the goal fast. We've got now seven papers showing that uh, basically a low-dose, uh, you know, trophic feed is equivalent to trying to get the goal as fast as possible. So don't worry about goal. That's not a big issue anymore trying to get to go that first 48 72 hours i don't believe is a key issue here so especially in these patients who may when 30 percent have some gi upset when uh, showing show up start slowly at 10 to 20 mils per hour advance that to 80 percent of the goal by the end of the first week if they're medically stable try to maintain that that rate if there's worsening hypothermodynamics you might want to try to keep uh, at the low rate and then add parenteral so essentially, if we're unable to progress for five to seven days, consider a supplemental parenteral. If the patient was malnourished pre-ICU admission, you may have to make that conversion earlier if you can't get enteral going, the parenteral may be earlier. So remember that escalating vasopressors, rising lactate levels, 
you know, with high respiratory support, uh, high respiratory support. There's non-invasive ventilation. We're using very little in these cases because we don't want to spread that virus, and we know that the the non-invasive ventilation techniques increase the spread and aerosolization of the virus. Do not check gastric residuals. Okay, now I know a lot of people say, wait a minute, we should do that. These patients are prone, they're on ECMO, we need to check residuals. That's first of all, we know from the Renier study in 2013, a prospective randomized trial for ICU patients, most of those patients were on ventilators. Uh, we don't, you know, gastric or digit volumes are not reliable in ICU patients. And, and the key thing for this population is checking several times a day increases the viral exposure and transmission. So do not, we do not recommend using gastric residual volume. So gastric feeding is preferred over post pyloric. Again, we don't, we don't think it's worth the, the time and energy to try to get an, uh, a feeding tube distal in this case. So we would say gastric feeding should be our preferred. And then we'll talk about bolus versus intermittent. I would give continuous feeding here uh, as opposed to bolus feeding because we have shown in the Europeans and their clinical guidelines recommend there's less diarrhea, you optimize blood sugar control, make it much easier, and there's certainly less staff interaction. You're not in there checking residuals. You're not in there checking the bolus, trying to bolus feed. So it's less time, less exposure, and it's been shown to be very safe. So when do you switch? That's the big question. When intro and gastric feeding is not an option, what we would normally do, we say, well, then go to a nasal jejunal tube. You're unsuccessful at gastric feeding, we'd move to intro feed, we'd move to jejunal feeding. We do not recommend this in this case. We say if you can't get can't get gastric feeding going at a reasonable rate, I would push with starting parenteral nutrition. If the signs of illness persist, I would go to parenteral. If escalating vasopressors, go to parenteral. We do not recommend, I'd either try promotility agents, maybe some seven elementals, a little bit of data would say maybe that's gonna help, but again, I wouldn't try to go to put a tube in the jejunum because it takes a lot more time, a lot more x-rays, and a lot of energy and exposure to the, to the healthcare workers. This is the study by Renier. I think it's a classic study. It's intro versus parenteral showing that it's relatively safe, and in this case, maybe even a little bit better in these patients that are in shock. This is a classic study now. It was published in 2018 in Lancet, 2,400 patients. And you'll notice there's mixed etiology of shock. About 20% of these patients have cardiogenic shock, about 60% septic shock, and the other 20% is mixed. Okay, the patients, uh, you can see, were fed pretty early. They were fed here within 15 hours of intubation at about half their caloric goal. So uh, what happened here, well, there were certainly no long-term outputs, no, no outcome differences. There was certainly no difference in mortality. But what they did show that the patients who had the, were fed intrally did have a little bit more ischemia. But again, they fed pretty fast, pretty early. They may have been part of the problem. We also showed increased vomiting, diarrhea, and colonic pseudo obstruction. So I certainly, in this case, like these patients are very high risk. Again, especially that hyperinflamed population, uh, like we saw in these COVID patients. So again. I think uh, parenteral is certainly safe and we have the data. What about when we do use parenteral? We should probably stay away from our pure soybean-based lipid emulsions during this first week. This is essentially like before we had uh, alternate lipids approved in this country. We used to, anybody that was septic or severely ill, we would hold off on their lipids the first week and then that only then give essential fatty acid requirement needs. Okay, the alternate lipids available to us now, are there's olive oil available? Oh, that's 80% olive oil, 20% soy, and there's also SMOF available, which is soy, MCT, olive oil, and fish oil. So you have two other options now rather than just pure soy. You, I think we can use these earlier because there's less pro-inflammatory soy-based solutions. Uh, the early anecdotal reports now, again, this is from a lot of early reports in the literature, now coming from China and now Italy, and also from discussions with some of the Italian ICU doctors, as well as New Orleans and New York City uh, doctors here, where we're seeing lots of cases. There's a rapid progression and elevation of lipids seen in these populations. So we need to be, follow the lipids. You need to measure a triglyceride pretty early in the parenteral course. And remember, a lot of profiles being used in these patients, and we should be at 10% sort of soy solutions. Don't forget to measure that in when you're counting uh, calories and looking at what you're delivering. What about prone positioning? Here's where the, the uh, sort of 
sometimes flying by the seat of our pants. There is data in prone positioning with enteral feeding. Uh, you'd be surprised. There's quite a bit in the literature. These uh, three articles I reference here are very good. The one by Renier is specifically looking at, at uh, nutrition, a 2010 article, to nutrition in these patients during the prone positioning. And in fact, there is no increased GI or pulmonary complications in the prone positioning. But remember, we've got to keep the head of the bed elevated at about 10 to 25 degrees. That will decrease our risk of aspiration, facial edema, and also decreases intra-abdominal hypertension. Now, you notice that photograph of two CT scans over up in the corner there. This is part of the benefit of, of proning. As you can see, the one on the left there is saying supine. You can see, so that's our routine positioning in the ICU. And you can see the posterior lungs there are full of fluid and full of uh, full of uh, ARDS type picture. When you prone those, you expand your tidal volumes, you expand your ability to ventilate more lung. You can see very nicely that that helps. So the proning really opens up some, some of the lung to give us more uh, benefit, more aeration. But this should not alter the way we start our feeding. So start a high protein isotonic formula, same as we would, but keep that head of the bed elevated at least 10 to 25 degrees. Actually, some people are using 10, uh, some of the newer reports are saying up to 25 degrees. So what about ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation? As you can see, that can be a veno veno to the groin, to the chest, in several ways. But basically, for those of you not familiar with the ECMO, you're sucking out the blood, aerating it, and oxygenating it outside the body, just like a heart-lung machine and then you put it back in just like a cardiac pump. So you're oxygenating the blood outside the body and replacing it in so we got oxygenated blood circulation. So we do have a couple of studies here, observational studies using a venoatrial uh, ECMO with enteral nutrition. And we have, there is one good study actually that shows uh, there's, when they compare early versus delayed enteral nutrition, show better improvement if we can start that fairly early. There's another study, a pretty good study, that shows early internal nutrition. If they delivered more calories early, they had a better outcome at one year and at 90 days. So the OB article there is from Japan. It's actually 220 patients. They look specifically on ECMO. Adults, these are adults. There's nothing to do with pediatric ECMO because we're not looking at that. But adult ECMO, they showed very nicely that early feeding uh, seemed to be protective and was uh, able to be done without any significant incidence of valid ischemia. What about feeding patients in shock? These, a lot of these patients rapidly go into sort of a pulmonary shock situation, uh, ARD, severe ARDS and shock, and some of it goes into cardiogenic shock as well. So we should manage these patients like we would any other patients. If they're unsuccessful, interval intolerance, which is common in this population, we should transition to parenteral early. We see both enteral and parenteral in the hemodynamically unstable patients. You can feed early if you can, if you can't transition if you need to. No reason to alter our standard guidelines for therapy except for not using jejunal feedings because we're minimizing exposure to our healthcare workers. So we've got to be careful with these patients. We have to go very slowly. If they're hemodynamically unstable, we've got to not progress things. Follow the hemodynamics, keep that steady first, and then move to something, move on to trying to feed. So we followed this uh, little slide here. You can see what, what happens. Remember, when the oxygen demand outstrips the oxygen supplies, where we get into trouble, and it starts sort of slow. Inadequate perfusion gives us cell hypoxia. The body tries to fix itself. It uses things like hypoxia inducible factor, which increases perfusion, increases rates of glycolysis, increases red blood cell production. But if we still go on with an energy deficit, we see lactic acidosis and anaerobic metabolism going. And once we get metabolic acidosis, that alters our blood vessels. The precapillary sphincters fail, and that's when we see our blood pooling in the periphery. So you can see it's a cycle here. Now we're getting what started with just lack of oxygen now has ended up with our vasculature system with massive pooling of the, the, the blood in the venous system rather than our arterial system so it can perfuse other organs. We continue with this on. We lose the ability to keep the electrochemical gradient in the cell. And the cells then start to leak sodium potassium. They go, leak, they lose that membrane potential. 
and then we start to leak toxic intracellular substances into the circulation and damage cells, and essentially leads us to destruction, dysfunction, and cell death. So you can follow it here. If we start at the top there with a picture of the lungs, when you have a patient, hypoxic pulmonary failure. So inability to ventilate and oxygenate, either or, but basically we can't oxygenate our organs. We then get gut hypoxia, and God knows we got billions and trillions of bacteria that are gonna now leak if we can't control our membranes there. We see mesenteric ischemia, loss of mucosal integrity, that with that loss of integrity, we see bacterial and toxins and translocation. We alter the immune response. The microbiome, which was stable and healthy, becomes a pathobiome and becomes aggressive. And the bacteria that are virulent bacteria then uh, take effect and, and alter the body's response. We then see endotoxins. We see pancreatic lipase and free fatty acids into the circulation not only by the portal vein, but through the lymphatics. That's probably the bigger route for a lot of those toxins. And now, because they went through the lymphatics, through the thoracic duct, they got large volume toxins now entering the thoracic duct at the superior vena cava, which dumps directly into the lungs, and we make things worse. We get more hypoxia, and that cycle continues until we see multiple organ system failure and death. This slide is a review of the studies looking at feeding during shock. And as you can see from uh, Matt the Berger study, nice study in 2005, a prospective descriptive, a descriptive study where she was looking at cardiogenic shock, but then Molly McGuigan and Fred Moore's group published a nice paper on hemorrhagic shock showing they could tolerate interval feeding. Then we have several papers on septic shock showing they could, they're able to tolerate interval feeding. And, and sometimes interval no, is the same as parenteral outcome, like that first Renier trial there, 2018, looked at prospectively interval versus parenteral, and they showed that both nutrition, either, both were beneficial, neither one could, and, but there was a reduced mortality with both interval and parenteral, is what I'm trying to say. So the bottom line is there, we can feed in shock, but we've got to be careful. Most of these prospective trials, as you can see, showed benefit with early feeding, if we can do it, early intro feeding. Now, I have to say that I put this disclaimer in there because now we're into the speculation phase, okay? And remember, when we're dealing with patients, especially in an area like COVID-19, where we're dealing with a population which you don't really have big studies, we've got to be, when we deliver our medical information, we've always got to look at being fully transparent. The worst thing we can do as healthcare professionals is give false hope, oh, we're going to try this, and this this is going to work, and this miracle nutritional product is going to be great. We just don't have that data specifically. There's no studies that are available. Like, so if no, if no studies are available, we need to consistently give a solid fact-based science data. If it's available, if we don't have it, then we've got to have rooted that those facts, scientific facts have to be rooted in a good, rational hypothesis. So let's look at some areas. But remember, there's no COVID specific data here. We're looking at theory, extrapolations from other viral illnesses, and even some anecdotes. Let's first look at fish oil because that's very popular. Uh, we know there's some data on the SPMs or specialized pro-resolving mediators, which are in products of fish oil metabolism. You have, if, uh, have a EPA and DHA on board, your body will make these. You don't have to buy these, your body will make these. And we'll look at some of the data on viral clearance. We'll look at some of the data on probiotics. Remember, that's mostly rhinovirus data. It's not a coronavirus data, but that's rhinovirus data. So vitamin supplements, what about inflammation uh, drugs and things? And then about absorption dynamics. We know that if we give some of the peptides are first to come back after there's been significant mucosal injury, the first, one of the first transporters to go is the mucosal, the Pepti-1, which is the peptide transporter, and it's the first one to come back after a significant injury to the GI tract. So that may alter what we use there. First, let's look at, at this so-called SPMI concept. Okay, as you see it, this is time versus magnitude of response, and it's looking at the inflammatory response here. So what do we see? First, we see edema in the lungs, then we see polymorphonuclear lymphocytes get into our leukocytes get into the white into the lung, and then we see we've got two options: we can go in a chronic inflammatory ARDS phase, or we can undergo some of those apoptotic 
PMNs can undergo epherocytosis. Epherocytosis is basically from the Greek word meaning taken to the grave. The body then can absorb some of those. Those macrophages are taken up. So we, we increase the rate at resolution. We also change our pro-inflammatory macrophages. The M sign there is the pro-inflammatory macrophage goes to a pro-resolving macrophage. So now we've got macrophages which are enhancing the resolution of inflammation. To me, this is the perfect scenario to use this in. So, as you saw, our I concept here is we know there's inflammation. We need and some inflammation in some cases to cure wounds and to heal wounds, but we don't want it to go into a chronic inflammatory state like in ARDS where it gets out of control. So once we've had the inflammatory state to draw in what we need, the cytokines, white cells, whatever we need, healing cells, then we want it to resolve so we can go back to normal tissue and normal healing. So that's our ideal. So as you can see here, uh, we have some very interesting data published by uh, Biley in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, some fascinating work on the idea of these SPM, specialized pro-resolving molecules. It says here resolvent because that was the early name for these because they resolved inflammation and they used in this mouse model. So they started basically with fish oils, as you can see, and then they got the, the body converts them to these SPMs and with fish oils and SPMs on board. What did it show with SPMs? They had better survival in the mouse models that are infected with, with virus. In this case, it was influenza virus, but it decreased influenza replication and killed the virus, basically killed the virus and inhibited uh, the inflammation. Remember, this is now extrapolating to a human model. Here's some more with the herpes virus, again, in the eye. Again, very good data with herpes in the eye, again, showing these SPMs control the inflammation related to the herpes virus. We know, in fact, that the SPMs are so-called resolvins and SPMs increase phagocytic response and killing a bacteria and killing a, and actually in hand, engulfing viruses also. So we know the data is very good and very solid. As you can see, this very nice article in 2012 is a it's showing how the infection regulates these pro-resolving media production. The body then can then enhance the production and clear the bacteria faster. So here's another uh, paper by Jess Dolly. Very interesting paper. Jess used to work with uh, Charlie Surhan in Boston. Excellent uh, work where they looked at septic patients with ARDS. And they showed very interesting that those patients, this is patient work now with sepsis. They showed those patients who had more SPMs did better. Okay, so they now again this is association, not causation, but they showed that these rat these resolution lipid mediators are associated with better survival and decreasing ARDS. So very interesting here. We can nicely extrapolate this data to say at least we know that people that had a higher SPM levels did better in the ARDS model. What about other viruses. Well, the rhinovirus is a cold virus, as you know, and uh, it's not a coronavirus, you know, it's a, it's a respiratory virus. So if we look at what we can show with probiotics in this setting, well, very interesting. Even the Cochrane analysis, and as you all know, the Cochrane analysis is a group of very conservative people. They only look at all these different studies, but they looked at 12 studies included looking at can probiotics alter our response to a rhinovirus. Again, not the coronavirus, but a rhinovirus. And they showed very nice that an upper respiratory tract virus was cleared better. They had better response at lower upper respiratory tract infections, and they reduced the mean duration of the upper respiratory infections with probiotics. So I think, again, extrapolation, but it may be beneficial because it's certainly easy to do. Now, what about vitamin and mineral supplementations? A lot of animal, animal data here, a lot of theoretical data. Again, I want to emphasize there's no COVID-2 specific data, COVID-19 specific data, okay? So vitamin A, yeah, I think there's some very interesting data on coronavirus. As you know, coronavirus, as you may know, affects chickens also, but if we give chickens a very low vitamin A diet, they actually get 
they actually get a coronavirus and it does help in that setting. But again, that's chickens, you know, so it's hard to extrapolate. What about B1, B2, B6? The reports on the B vitamins are all over the map. So you've got many saying, yes, we need more. Some saying we don't need any more. Suffice it to say that if we give normal amounts, we don't see much big benefit from some huge cocktail. Vitamin C, there is some data in the 2003 coronavirus, the SARS-1, or the coronavirus that, that uh, it started in China again. It went to Japan, and we had Asia pretty much had most of it. Uh, that case, we did see some work with vitamin C, and there was two or three papers out of Japan and one out of, uh, out of uh, Italy that showed some benefit with some extra vitamin C. Again, it's not the, the SARS-2 virus we're talking about now. Vitamin D, you know, again, all over the map, animal models say, yes, yeah. some people tell you vitamin D cures everything. Some people say it doesn't do anything. But I think if you're deficient, it's probably helpful. We know that in viral infections, other viral infections, not this one, but other viral infections, uh, we can show that if you're vitamin D deficient, you certainly need to take um, get more vitamin D. Vitamin E, again, data is all over the map, almost all uh, animal data, but certainly beneficial for Coxsackie uh, virus uh, B3. There's good data there with animals and, and a lot of agricultural animals. That's a big problem. Selenium, lots of speculation on doses, timing, how much, when, if you're deficient, not deficient, where you live, you know, what your, what your fruit and vegetables had in it, that kind of thing. And again, with zinc, we can say if you're beneficial, clearly, if you're deficient, clearly it's going to be beneficial. If you're not deficient, the data is pretty great. So the bottom line to these, there's insufficient data for any additional specific supplement over standard vitamin mineral supplementation we would normally give, either in our enteral or our parenteral solutions, unless there's vitamin deficiency present. There's no data currently for an antioxidant cocktail. Some of you may have heard Matha Berger give her talk uh, for the asthma meeting just recently over the uh, virtual uh, format, and she is giving all of her COVID-19 patients uh, uh, mega, uh, sort of a uh, antioxidant cocktail using selenium and vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin uh, E. So I think that's possible. We don't have data, so I think we've got to be careful. Remember, I remember very early thinking, you know, it seems pretty logical to say, well, let's just give some and see if it works. But remember, we can hurt people with too much vitamins. Oh, too much minerals. I can remember the early days of TPN. We used to go, look, all these anemic people, let's just give them some iron. And what did we do when they gave them iron? That was nature's way to sequester the iron. We gave more iron. We just gave more benefit for the bacteria, and we killed people. Thinking we were doing them good. So I think we got to be careful with massive doses of trace minerals and things, because many times Mother Nature knows what's best, and it lowers them. So we got to be a little careful. So I think that's concluding. We're going to have a question and answer session. So that I think the key thing here is delivery of nutritional therapy in the SARS-CoV-2 patient. We should follow our principles of routine critical care nutrition as recommended by the European or by the American guidelines, societal guidelines, or by the Canadian guidelines, you know, SCCM, Aspen, Espen. It really are all pretty much basic. What's different here is is we're promoting clustered care. We're trying to decrease the frequency of healthcare providers, decrease the spread of this. So we don't want to check gastric residual volumes. Maybe early, earlier to PN, if we can't feed through the stomach, go to PN. Avoid these, these uh, you know, personnel, extensive or personnel requiring endoscopic fluoroscopic placement, checking residuals every four hours you know, bolus feeding, those kind of things to minimize exposure we should be trying to do. We should not do those. Minimize contamination of additional equipment and promoting optimal nutrition through the ways we can do it by using our standard treatment with those few exceptions. Yes, um, Dr. Martindale, thank you. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Your guidance to feed the COVID patient is extremely timely. Uh, so many people have been asking for this information. All right, let's move on to the questions. We have gotten many, many questions. The first question, uh, Dr. Martindale, is in the SARS-CoV-2 patient or the COVID-19 patient. It sounds as if you're proposing 
a more aggressive approach for parental nutrition than what we see in the current Aspen and Aspen critical care guidelines. Is this true? And would you suggest trophic feeding during parental nutrition to provide the non-nutritional benefits to the gut? Yeah, this is a, that's a very good question. It's an anticipated question. I would say uh, we probably will go to parental earlier than we would in the normal ICU patient because in a normal ICU patient, we can use nasal jejunal feeding. You know, we can, if we, we're not successful in the stomach after trial, we, we give some prokinetic agents, that doesn't work. We maybe try a semi-elemental form if that doesn't work. Then we go to nasal jejunal feeding with a nasal jejunal feeding tube place with a, either a track or a, a system, but multiple x-rays usually, lots of handling the oral pharyngeal secretions and getting those done. We would recommend rather than doing that, increasing exposure, we would then go to parenteral if we cannot use the gas stomach through gastric feeding. Uh, now, would I recommend uh, trophic feeding? Uh, while we're going to, I definitely would. We know that we need about 20 to 25 cc's an hour. If you can get that, that's usually pretty safe. Uh, that seems to be what we need to get our benefits, our non-nutritional benefits of enteral feeding, lowering the inflammatory response, maintaining a, a reasonably healthy microbiome, preventing it to going to a pathobiome, and, and uh, you know, those sort of things. All right, thank you. We have um, a question from a physician who he's seeing some of his patients go into a rapid acute kidney um, failure, a few of them needing hemodialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy. Uh, do you have any information on this? Um, um, also, as part of his question, there's decreased availability of fentanyl and some um, and some other uh, narcotics, they're having to use morphine, and they're seeing opioid ileus. So do you have any suggestions for these physicians trying to manage these patients? We can use some of the peripheral opioid blockers. It helps sometimes in these where this is uh, some of the methyl methyltrexone. They sometimes are very helpful if they got opioid-related issues in the GI tract, but I would still try to use the gut when possible. Uh, the, the first part of that question was, uh, what was that again? Uh, acute. Cindy? They're going into acute. Oh, acute renal failure. failure. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think, yeah, we would treat this like we would anybody else with acute renal failure. Certainly keep the protein relatively high. You've got them on a dialysis or some sort of, uh, you know, renal replacement stuff. So I would there say you can still keep the protein relatively high and use your standard formulas in most cases. And they're asking, um, the same person was asking, wouldn't bolus feeding help induce some distal um, chronic reflexive contractions? Uh, there is a gastric colic reflex, but in the ICU setting, we lose a gastric colic reflex just like we lose some of the re receptive relaxation in the stomach. So the gastric colic reflex in, in the ICU patient who's got highly inflamed, probably not too functional. There's been two papers looking at that in animal models and they've shown that no benefit, there's no big difference when they were on ventilators and pressors. Okay, and some of the residents are starting treatment for uh, constipation. Should standard treatment like Miramax be used or would lactulose be better? Uh, yeah, I, I can't say lactulose would be better. You know, the lactulose, I don't I don't know there's going to be one's going to benefit over the other. I think it'd be fine. You know, one's obviously an osmotic and one is more of a, is a metabolic change by altering, uh, binding it, you know, it changes the pH in the colon. Yeah, I don't think they want to be any better than the other. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question is, if enteral nutrition is successful at low rates, at what point do we become more aggressive in meeting even the 70 to 80% calorie requirements um, that you suggest for feeding these patients? So how long do we feed trophically and when is it appropriate to go to a goal rate? Yeah, great question. Again, I think that we, we know at least that seven to 10 days at trophic is, is reasonable. Uh, we, you know, adding supplement if needed to be supplemental parenteral, but after about two weeks in a rehab phase, clearly we should go to caloric goals. After probably 10 days or two weeks before we go into a chronic, uh, you know, chronic critical illness, we need to get up to goal, up to full goal if we can. Now, luckily, Europe's got lots of indirect calorimetry going, and they can give us a little better handle on that. 
in this country, we don't do quite as much, but I would say after a week to 10 days, we should try to get the goal that the patient tolerating. Okay. So is it safe to use enteral formulas containing arginine in these patients? That's a great question. Another one I sort of anticipated. Yes. You know, there was some early data and some questions about does arginine cause problems? Is arginine, arginine uh, you know, is, is a potential in the septic patient. So we got a patient with uh, acute sepsis, basically, and we give them a, a arginine, which goes to uh, basically it serves nitric oxide plus citrulline. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So we thought, why would we ever want to give a vasodilator to a septic patient who's already got refractory sepsis? Well, we've now had four, at least four good studies. Nick Deutz and several others have done good studies in this area and shown actually that giving arginine to a septic patient increases cardiac output, does not increase problems with vasodilatation, it causes no significant hemodynamic problems with it. In fact, it's beneficial and has better output, less lactate, clearance of lactate is faster with arginine. So I love arginine. I'm probably the wrong guy to ask because we use arginine a lot in our patients, uh, arginine-containing formula in our patients, so I think it's, a, it's, it's beneficial. Okay, I'm going to check and see if Dr. Patel is on the call. Dr. Patel, are you on? Hi, yes I am, good afternoon. Welcome, so please feel free to chime in. I have a ton of questions here. Um, before I go to the next question, is there are there any words of wisdom that you wanna share with us uh, concerning the nutritional support of patients? I understand you've been treating quite a few of them recently. Yeah, uh, we have. Um, what I will say, and I'm sure Dr. Martindale has addressed this uh, quite a bit, is that I, I think we're in a in a unique uh, phase here where I think nutrition is going to be a key component because supportive care is the mainstay of care for all these patients. And nutrition, as all of you know, is a key aspect of supportive care. But I think we have to also take into consideration those guiding principles that Dr. Martindale um, alluded to probably earlier in the um, uh, PowerPoint. And those guiding principles are based on what is happening with our, our COVID patients. And so specifically, we want to minimize how much interaction we have. And that's one thing that we're doing in our unit as well. Uh, we want to uh, cluster care as much as, as possible. And then, you know, in an era where our resources are being diminished very quickly, we want to try and preserve as many resources as we can, specifically things like personal protective equipment. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going, and um, you all just answer the questions as you uh, see the most fit. So one of the questions that came through is that um, there was some emphasis about using continuous feeding in the ICU in a situation of enteral pump scarcity. What would you advise? Uh, yeah, if you're out of pumps, you can gravity feed, uh, like the old yep. days, in the stomach. You can gravity feed. Jay, any thoughts on that? If you had to, I yeah. Like to yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing. You can, uh, you, you can, you can definitely do uh, gravity feed. I guess the, the the control over the amount of, of feeding that goes in, you know, might be a little bit more limited in that, in that situation. So, um, I, I I would certainly avoid uh, um, bolus feeding uh, these patients because again, during that first week of critical illness, especially those who come in in multi organ failure, they're going to have a higher risk of uh, enteral feeding intolerance, but it also violates one of those principles we just talked about, which is that you want to minimize the interaction that you have, uh, direct contact you have with the, with these patients, and and bolus feeding will will certainly set you up for that. Okay, yeah, I, I know. And, uh, seen... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say I've seen on chat rooms where they're splitting a pump between two patients, 12 hours of feeding for one, and then 12 hours of feeding feeding for the other. That's also a, um, an option, I think. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, if they're going to go 12 hours on, 12 hours off. You've got to be careful that the rates are going to have to be quite a bit higher. So in these patients, they may have altered motility. So we've got to be a little cautious. I think, uh, remember, if we think six drops a minute is about 10 cc's an hour. So if you do, you can count the drops out by just your drip feed and then just add it and just feed in the stomach. That's what a lot of the, a lot of the world still does that. They don't have the, the beauty of having pumps like we do in this country. Okay, um, Dr. Zudin Kuthichiri suggests that muscle loss occurs at two to 3% per day for the first 10 days of hospitalization in critically ill patients. 
if we had to pick one macronutrient over the other in terms of provision, would it be protein then? Should we be trying to meet the 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram actual body weight per day recommendation? Yes, I think so. I think uh, Zudin's work is certainly seminal work. Uh, I see what Jay thinks, but I think I would shoot for protein. But I think we've got to be careful about timing and deliver protein. As Zudin was just was nicely showed us at his asthma meeting lectures, the first couple of days, uh, protein probably is not utilized that much. So don't try to give you know two gram per kilo in the first couple of days. But after that, it seems like the protein is clearly when it can be utilized when the patient is metabolically stable. They do very well, and the better when they've got mitochondrial function. That's part of the key. There is the ability. Remember, the mitochondria is responsible not only for for beta, you know, oxidation of, of nutrients under enough oxygenation, but also for the urea cycle. So you, he's looking at looking at re regulating, looking between creatinine urea cycles and levels. So I think that's important early on, probably not as much protein the first two or three days. And after that, after two days, certainly you can jack up the protein. Up to, And I would pick protein as my one nutrient if I had to only pick one. Jay, any thoughts? Yeah, I would agree. And what I would say is, what I would add to um, Bob's comments are, um, we don't know when patients switch between the early acute phase of critical illness and the late acute phase of critical illness. But there may be some surrogate markers that you can look for at the bedside. So for instance, at the bedside, what I look for is, are my vasopressor requirements coming down? Um, what's happening to um, my patient's ventilatory status? Am I able to get them extubated or closer to um, extubation? And if the answers to some of those questions are yes, then perhaps the inflammatory response is starting to wane a little bit more. And as that happens, those might be surrogates of mitochondrial function, perhaps not being as bad as it was the day prior. And at the same time, that might be an opportunity to then ramp up or even change uh, the uh, important uh, macronutrient that you're going to, to deliver. In this case, we're talking about protein. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is around fluid requirements. Uh, the question is, how should fluid requirements be calculated for these ventilated patients? There's um, this particular person seeing plus one to plus four edema in these patients. Is that what you're seeing as well, Dr. Patel? We're seeing a couple of different phenotypes in these COVID patients. Um, I don't know if any more are going to emerge, but data out of Italy seems to suggest right now that there's two key phenotypes in these patients. One phenotype in these patients, so let me take, let me take a step back. The, the, the thing that's the most obvious is that these patients come in in respiratory failure and their oxygen levels are super, super low. And then the question is, is why? And so one phenotype we're seeing is that these patients have an, almost like a classic uh, acute respiratory distress or ARDS-like uh, a pattern where we just have difficult time delivering oxygen into them and we just can't blow off enough carbon dioxide in some of these patients um, as well. The other phenotype we're seeing is it looks like an ARDS, but it doesn't behave like an ARDS. And those patients, a lot of them end up developing um, even some form of cardiomyopathy. So we're seeing that these patients have some, uh, some, some cardiac dysfunction as well. Now, how to identify um, how much fluid these, these patients need, I think the first thing to do is to figure out what's the phenotype. Maybe ask your intensivist, what, is, what, what do you think is the phenotype that we're seeing in these patients? Are we seeing the ARDS, I can't, I can't ventilate these individuals, or are we seeing the other uh, uh, phenotype? The reason why this might be important is because you may want to limit the amount of fluid you give to the person who's got the uh, cardiomyopathy phenotype. Now, I will caution you and say that um, we, we seem to think edema, some of it at least, may be cosmetic in the ICU because it's not a representation of what's happening with the intravascular uh, fluid compartments and it's more extravascular fluid compartments. So I think you have to take that into consideration as well. And it makes it very challenging because a lot of these patients have been prone and so we can't get like ultrasound assessments to figure out what their vo uh, volume status is like or even if they'll respond to any more volume. But at this point, what I will say, again, just to summarize, is that look for that key cardiomyopathy piece. And if your intensivists are telling you that, hey, I think they got a cardiomyopathy, you may want to reduce the amount of fluid in those patients. Yeah, and I think that fits with the whole concept now of this endotheliopathy. When they get that, they get this leak, a tremendous leak. And if that starts to seal, then you may be able to get some of that fluid off if you need to. Yep. Okay, good. 
um, their clarification for the amount of protein that's needed, it was 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram actual body weight and not adjusted body weight, correct, Dr. Martindale? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so how should we calculate protein and calorie needs for the obese patient as well as the patient with a low BMI? If you follow the Aspen guidelines for the obese patient, you're already re uh, estimating about 70% of maintenance needs, but what about that patient with a low BMI? Yeah, I think a deal, a deal body weight, if they're a oh, low BMI, wait, I'm sorry, we're talking about obese. Yeah, so there's two questions, right? There's an obese side of it. Do we stick with what the guidelines, the Aspen SCCM guidelines say, because the uh, obesity formulas already calculate 70% of needs, or do we need to go even lower in the COVID patients? That's for obesity. And then the second part of the question is, how do we calculate for the patient with a low BMI? No, okay, for the obese patient, I go with what the SCCM and, and the Aspen guidelines go with. For the low BMI, I'd go to ideal body weight. If they're below ideal body weight, I'd shoot for ideal body weight. And just feed trophically initially and then slowly ramp up. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I'd go the first couple of days, trophic, and see if they're tolerating, if they're doing well, and that inflammation is going down. Then I think, like Jay was saying, if we're starting to see signs of inflammation, I would move it up. But otherwise, I'd, you know, if you can't move it up every time you do, they get in trouble and then back that back down. So the next question is in regards to prone, feeding the patient in a prone position. So um, can you discuss the intro feeding of this type of patient? And especially if that patient's on a paralytic, what's our major concern and how can we overcome any of these concerns? And can we feed these patients at goal rate? So can you just discuss feeding the patient in prone position? We have some observational level data. So let me just uh, say that whenever we look at data, we have to first identify, is it safe to do it? Um, and meaning, are they gonna tolerate it? And then we can start talking about outcomes related to the intervention. So the, what we're talking about here is feeding the prone patient. And the data that we have so far seems to suggest that uh, prone patients do tolerate uh, early enteral nutrition. And, uh, and so it seems to be a safe option. What we don't have is we don't have randomized controlled trial level data that has looked at outcomes um, in this population. So you, 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 you give nutrition early uh, enterally versus not, for example, in a randomized control trial. We don't have that data. So I will say that we are feeding uh, our prone COVID patients, which is almost all of them in our ICU right now, um, and we are initiating at a rate of uh, 10 to 30 uh, mLs per hour, so trophic feed, and we won't ramp it up um, until we start seeing that there's some signs that the inflammatory response is starting to come down. Now, with regards to the paralytic question, um, being on a paralytic is not a contraindication to um, enteral feeds. Um, because you remember that the um, Meisner's and Auerbach's plexus control uh, the autonomic components and allow for propulsion in the gut uh, through the autonomic nervous system. So we have been paralyzed, and I would do it the exact same way, 10 to 30 uh, cc's with a slow ramp up while monitoring for early early enteral feeding uh, intolerance, uh, particularly within the first few days. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and the paper which is best addresses is that Renier paper, 2010 Clinical Nutrition, which is one of the references on the slides. He actually looked at that and looked at the volume of the gastric residual volume in the supine versus prone and showed it was slightly higher gastric residuals in the a prone patient, but it was not significant difference. There was no increased aspiration. That was a prospective trial, obviously, in very sick patients requiring proning. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, how should we feed the pregnant woman who has COVID-19 on the ventilator? Jay, you want to take it? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, so I will tell you, we actually had a uh, postpartum hemorrhage in our ICU uh, in a woman who was diagnosed with uh, COVID pneumonia. Um, we just extubated her yesterday and she went to the floor. Um, we didn't obviously prone her, um, but we did, we did feed her. Um, we did, you, you know, standard uh, polymeric, but I can't cite you any data because there isn't any data uh, in this population uh, right now. Nothing. And so I yeah. would treat, I would treat the, the pregnant uh, COVID patient um, as you would um, any other critically ill patient that you're looking to feed, uh, with the caveat being that you're not going to prone them because pregnancy is contraindication. Uh, to Absolutely. Prone. 
I would agree. Okay, thank you. So many of um, many of the patients on the ventilator are um, glucose intolerant. These COVID patients. Is it helpful to try to manage the blood glucose with lowering the carbohydrate content of the feeding, whether it's parenteral or enteral, in addition to insulin management? If I may, what I'll say is one of the reasons that the recent ESPEN guideline is recommending starting at a hypocaloric, or even call it trophic, if you will, uh, nutrition dose early in critical illness is because there's also some component of endogenous glucose production that happens in critically ill patients. So, you know, remember, uh, amino acids are rampantly moving towards the liver, and the, gl and the liver is just ramping up uh, gluconeogenesis. Um, and that may differ in different people. And so what I would say at this point is that I don't know if I would necessarily cut off nutrition as a result of hyperglycemia in this patient population. But instead, I would manage the hyperglycemia a little bit more aggressively. Because yeah. remember that a little bit of trophic nutrition is gonna be helpful to preserve some of the gut trophic functions um, for, for this very vulnerable population to multiple organ failure. Yeah, and it, we've got early studies, even as far back as the 70s, would show that giving more, a bunch more nutrition doesn't shut off this endogenous catabolism which takes place. You know, after 100 grams a day of glucose, you're not changing anything. So I would say, just like Jay said, I would continue to feed them and just be aggressive with their management and control and be careful the first couple of days. But after that, I wouldn't, I would continue to give nutrition support. And we don't want to shut off the nutrition. You say, well, should we shut off just the carbohydrate? No, I wouldn't. I would lower the reasonable levels of carbohydrate. Certainly, we, to use the protein, we have to have carbohydrate available also. Okay. All right, so how can we optimize the provision of omega-3 fatty acids? I think Dr. Martindale, you suggested that uh, fish oil is beneficial in these patients. Yeah, there, no question. We know that to make the SPMs, which cause a resolution of inflammation, we have to have uh, adequate fish oils. The question is how much is adequate in this case. We know about 0.1 to 0.2 gram per kilo per day. It gives us adequate to make SPMs. There's three studies now looking at what conversion rate between, we're looking at how much conversion takes place between the EPA, DHA, and the resolvent uh, byproducts or end products. And uh, it very nicely shows that you can do that and do it pretty easily. And you need about between four and six grams a day to seem like to get us adequate levels. This looks like four grams a day was doing what the most recent study shows you can get SPM production. Okay, thank you. So these patients are extremely inflamed with elevated CRPs. Is there anything we can do to help nutritionally to help decrease the cytokine storm? Well, we're just learning about this cytokine storm seems to be associated with the COVID-2, uh, I mean, the SARS-2 group. Uh, so, you know, like we would any other inflamed patient, like a trauma patient, severely traumatized patient, I think early interval nutrition, we know lowers the metabolic response, lowers the attenuates the metabolic response. We know that early delivery of protein helps. We know that the fish oils help uh, attenuate those things. We know that prevention, uh, allowing interval feeding to prevent the conversion of a pathobiome to a, or a microbiome to a pathobiome decreases the metabolic uh, response. So I think it's like any other hyperinflamed patient, there's nothing more than we can do in those patients already. Jay, any thoughts okay. there? My jaw's on the floor. I don't know if I have anything else to add to that, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, no, so what yeah. I, what I, no, let me, let me just add, uh, just kind of almost reiterate what, what, what he just said in um, maybe a slightly different way. You know, the, the gut is what, the breakdown of the gut defenses and the gut barrier function is what is going to ultimately contribute a lot to these patients developing multiple organ failure. And so all of the things that um, leak through the gut, the toxic lymph that's formed in the gut goes to distant organs like the, um, the lungs, for example, and can perpetuate the already existing lung injury as well as the acute kidney injury. And so we can't emphasize enough that giving a little bit of nutrition or trophic rate nutrition may help attenuate, you know, some of that uh, function as Bob really nicely um, alluded 
All right, yeah. thank you. So, so Dr. Patel, are you using micronutrient supplementation, any type of micronutrient, IV micronutrient cocktail on your patients? In our very first patient, which was about three weeks ago, um, we used high dose of vitamin C in this patient population. Um, and that's the only thing that, we, that we've given so far, because that's what's kind of been studied um, in the Citrus Ali uh, paper that was published in JAMA uh, last year. And that, that study looked at giving high dose of vitamin C in patients with acute lung injury, which is kind of what we're seeing in our patient population. Um, but short of that, um, I'm not using any other micronutrient cocktail right now. Um, people have looked at things like high dose uh, thiamine and hydrocortisone. Um, what I will say is that it's the combination of things that uh, has been mostly studied. And I think a lot of individuals are a little bit leery on giving steroids in this population because there's reports that giving steroids in this population may actually be harmful. Um, and so I have not provided any thiamine and hydrocortisone uh, vitamin C cocktails. I've used vitamin C alone, um, again, in this patient population. Um, but we just don't have any data right now to support using um, anything else, particularly in this uh, patient population. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think we got to be careful until we have some data in this population. So, uh, There's a lot uh, of studies ongoing with this population. I think we talked about 250, Jay, was it, was registered uh, the, on the government website already? That's right. Uh, the uh, director of critical care at the University of Pittsburgh gave a nice interview on the JAMA Network website two days ago. And he said 359 clinical trials have been registered yeah. for COVID yeah. alone. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so we'll have some data. So I did have a question come in relative to vitamin C provision as well. And um, the concern was around kidney function. And do you use any type of measurement for caution to prevent oxalate stones? Or, or is there a creatinine clearance or a glomerular filtration rate that you monitor if you are giving high levels of vitamin C? Less than 35, I think, is a big number. Can you start TPN in an unstable patient who is on multiple vasopressors? I personally wouldn't. Uh, I would wait to get some sense of stabilization. You're only going to confuse the picture because they won't use what, the, what your nutrient you're giving them anyway. They're severely unstable. They're not going to use much of that. I would be very cautious in a highly unstable patient starting parenteral. You've already got insulin resistance, and you're going to have more trouble than it's worth. I'd give it a good 24 hours of stabilization before trying. What do you think, Jay? I agree, and there's a big logistical component to that as well, because when you are when you have an unstable patient, the name of the game at that point is resuscitate. And when you resuscitate, you're pouring all kinds of things you know, through the IV, and the effect of what it may have with the parenteral nutrition running is unclear. Uh, but more importantly, you may be using an IV line that the – you know, that, that could be used for things like rapid administration of antimicrobials or IV fluid boluses, for example. Okay. All right. The next question is, um, if there, is there an issue with the use of a promotility agent and hydroxychloroquine and QTC prolongation? I've heard that say it twice. I have no personal experience and I've not seen any data that would say you can't use them together, but I've heard it said that people are seeing prolonged QTs. So I, I would defer to Jay if he's seen it. That's exactly right. Um, we've had, again, this is anecdotal, but we've had a couple of patients go into torsades, uh, which is a tachyarrhythmia uh, that effectively you know, precedes like a cardiac arrest, uh, who have received hydroxychloroquine and other QT prolongating agents. Um, so anytime we have patients on uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, we tend to avoid any other agent that may uh, prolong the uh, QTC. Okay. Dr. Marndale, somebody would like you to repeat what you just said about creatinine clearance. So you said a, a creatinine clearance of 35? Yes. Yeah, under 35 is where we start seeing renal stone issues. And so I think above 35, we've got enough adequate uh, circulation, adequate perfusion. All right, the next question is around serum triglycerides. If they're greater than 400, should IV lipids be held? So this might be a long-winded response here, but and so bear with me. 
one of the things that we're starting to see in this COVID population, in a subset of this COVID population, is something called um, cytokine storm. Uh, some people call it a secondary uh, HLH-like phenomena. Um, now, in order to diagnose this sort of secondary HLH-like phenomena, um, one of the key criteria for that is a serum triglyceride level. There is something called an H score, and the H score takes into components that um, are, are reflective of an inflammatory response gone haywire. And one of them is, is again, the serum triglyceride. So what I would say at this point is that if you have an individual that you're checking um, triglyceride levels on, one of the things to do is to distinguish, is this represents a highly inflammatory state, i.e. cytokine storm, or is this truly from my lipids? The second thing I will say is that many of these patients are going to be on propofol as well. And after about two days of receiving propofol, we'll start seeing the lipid levels go up, uh, triglyceride levels go up in the body as well. And if you uh, have a patient on propofol, that's the other question to ask. Is this a result of the propofol? And so it might require just a trial off propofol before discontinuation of uh, parenteral lipids uh, altogether. Okay, good. That was a future question, so thank you. The next question is in regards to probiotics. Do you suggest a probiotic, and if so, which one? Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew this was coming. Yeah, we have no data in this population of probiotics. Do I have lots of data on probiotics in the ICU? It is routine in our ICU with ARDS with all kinds of ICU issues, we give probiotics to most of the, all those patients. So I have no trouble giving, personally giving probiotics. Which probiotic? We use a local yogurt here. It's actually not so local anymore. They're actually gone nationwide in some cases. So the key bacteria, which seem to be the ones that with the most data in the ICU are lactobacillus rhamnosus, lactobacillus casei, Lactobacillus plantarum, recent data on Lactobacillus salivarius, most of that out of Europe. Uh, and let me see, plantarum, KCI, uh, rhamnosus. I think that's the four big ones. That there's one more I can't think of right now. Ruteri, Lactobacillus ruteri. The ruteri data has been around a long time, but the rhamnosus, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, is the most consistent one which we see data from the ICU on. All right, thank you. In terms of parental nutrition, what kind of macronutrient mix do you recommend for these patients? I give a little more protein and, uh, you know, uh, probably 25% protein, 30%, 40% to carbohydrate, and give the rest of a mixed lipid solution. Okay. And uh, the next question is in regards to proning. So why was it recommended that only 10 to 20 degrees for proning? Of the head of bed elevation 10 to 20 degrees for proning when the typical recommendations are 35 to 40. Yeah, that's when they're supine 35 to 40. But when the proning, we, we don't we already changed the dynamics already, so you don't need as much. The aspiration okay. issue. So, so 10 to 25 is all that's been recorded. The 25 is a little newer. The most recent papers are using 25, but in the original paper that compared them. They were using 10 to 15 percent prone. Jay, any different thoughts? What are you guys using? Yeah, we're doing probably a little bit more. We're probably proning at about 20 to 30 degrees of uh, yeah. you know what's called reverse trend Ellenberg position, right. uh, where the head is up a little bit more. The reason the, the reason for that is because um, of the the blood flow to the lung. So again, yeah. when pa patients are supine versus when they're prone, um, the blood flow and the injury to the lung is becomes redistributed. And when you when you lift the head of their bed up um, because of gravity, you know the distribution of injury can get can move as well. And so the the, the idea behind the Trendelenburg position is nothing more than how we redistribute blood flow and the injury to the lung. Yeah, and then also facial edema and the oral pharyngeal edema is better, and the aspiration is less if you got them got them uh, some reverse Trendelenburg. Most of the three or four big papers on that area are saying, you know, 10 to 25 percent. Okay. And uh, do you recommend holding the feeding one hour before or after switching to a prone position? Uh, yeah, just again, anecdotally in this population, we have not. And we have not seen any big issues. We are we prone for 16 hours and then supine for eight 
And so in between there, we are not holding um, our internal nutrition. Because again, remember, it's running at a trophic rate in most of these patients. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would, uh, the papers would support that too. They're not saying, they're saying 12 and 12 or 8, 16, even 8, uh, eight the other way, 8, 16. But a lot of them are using 12 and 12. And they don't, they're not talking about holding feeding for an hour each in. All right, and then I have a question. Um, does potassium play a role in moderate to severe cases? I mean, as far as cause or etiology or how to treat it or? Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. That's all I have is does okay. potassium play a role in yeah. moderate to severe cases, so. I would keep K okay. above 3.5 if they can. Okay. One thing I'll add to that since it's being asked is, um, you know, keep an eye on that magnesium. Because if you're, if you're, potassium and your calcium are low, chances are it's the magnesium. So you want to replace the magnesium first, and that's going to be really important for skeletal muscle function. Yeah, I think also for just cardiac function, keep the K above 4 and MAG above 2, your risk of cardiac arrhythmias, which is the high risk in this population, goes significantly down. Okay, could you repeat that? K above 4? Yeah, keep K above four, mag above two. A classic paper by Frank Sarah's group in Minnesota shows you can de significantly decrease your cardiac arrhythmias in the ICU setting. All right. Um, and I think we're going to have to take maybe one more question, and then we'll need to close. So the last question is, can you address the urea-creatinine ratio? And is this something we should be concerned about? Um, if it is, what ratio would you use to back off on the amount of protein that you give so that you aren't causing mitochondrial toxicity? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I wish I had a great answer. You know, I think that, that Zudin Puducherry, who's a genius, you know, when it comes to metabolism, has recently put this thing forward, and I honestly don't know enough about it to give him a good, honest answer there. So I'm a little more cautious the first couple of days. He thinks it's maybe not so critical after a few days, but the first few days of critical illness is where he worries about giving too much protein. Jay, we think there, we actually talked to him at this last meeting about this very issue. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm still a little, little rusty. Yeah, I share your sentiment in many ways. But one thing I will add is that there are many confounders that are going to drive that ratio, and um, one of the, the one of the biggest ones, of course, besides you know having acute kidney injury, um, are things like use of steroids, you know, or concomitant bleeding that that occurs in your critically ill patient. Those will drive up the urea levels uh, as well. And so I'm not sure how to work the confounders uh, into this particular ratio to then set my protein target. Yeah, that's my problem too. Is that I'm not there's too many people have a high creatinine or urea. Just because what's going on with them with them metabolically. Okay, right. thank you. All right, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Martindale and Dr. Patel, answering all these questions and addressing these concerns. And thank you to all healthcare providers striving to give the best possible patient care during these challenging days. And so, on behalf of Nestle Nutrition Institute, we hope that you found this information useful to your practice. And please enjoy the rest of your day and be safe.